This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. <clears throat> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is our Sunday morning Bible study. And I want to thank God for blessing us to be here this morning, blessing us to uh, be able to come together uh, remotely and be able to, again, study the Word of God. Again, this is the International Adult Bible Study Ministry. Uh, this week we will be studying um, Judges chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and verses 7 through 16. 7 through 16. And again, brothers and sisters, the mission of the International Adult Bible Study Ministry is to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus to Christ through the teaching of the Word of God. And having said that, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Let's clear our hearts this morning and let's prepare for our study for today. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us to be here this day. We ask and pray, Father, now that you would just quiet our hearts and our minds. And we ask and pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that you would now allow the Holy Spirit to take full control of this Bible study ministry and that he would touch each and every heart and give them an understanding of your holy word. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, again, our study is coming from uh, Judges chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 16. Our key verse for this morning comes from Judges chapter 6, verse 23, and it reads, The Lord said to Gideon, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Judges chapter 6, verse 23. Now, in our last study, brothers and sisters, we listened to the song of Moses, the song he had spoken to this new generation of Israelites who were preparing to come into the land of Canaan. In it, Moses called upon the heavens, the heavens and the earth, the earth, to bear witness to the calamities that would befall Israel if they sin against the Lord God. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, it spoke of the ultimate joy that would come with their final redemption, their final redemption. Now, the Song of Moses was mixed with past, present, and future events. And while in the land of Midian, the Lord God had said to Moses, telling him to do what? Go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh, he says. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. Moses obeys God. And after now he's um, 80 years old, he returns to Egypt. He confronts Pharaoh and repeats to him what the Lord God had commanded him to say. This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn, Moses tells, tells Pharaoh. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, the Lord is unchanging, immutable, and he keeps his word. Blessings came upon the children of Israel when they walked in obedience unto the Lord. The Lord God had always told the people beforehand of the rewards of blessings when they obey the Lord and the consequences of disobedience. The children of Israel was never surprised by the Lord God. He always gave them warnings. We need to also understand that among the three things the Lord has endowed mankind with, will, intellect, and emotions, it is the will's responsibility. It is our will responsibility 
that places mankind in the favor of God or the wrath of God. Our will is the soul's power to choose between what we are, what we will do, and our motive for doing it, you see. So in layman's terms, our choosing to do anything, brothers and sisters, or believing anything for that matter, originates first from our understanding of it, our intellect and our will to act upon what we understand. But listen carefully, brothers and sisters. Listen to what Joshua said. And this is a common phrase, and I believe everybody has heard it before. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, but as for me and my house, he does, he says what? We will serve the Lord. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And listen to Israel's response. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. It is a choice. It's that final step in man's decision to do either good or evil. On each occasion, it was the knowledge of what the Lord God commands and the final act of the will, which resulted in their decision to either obey God or not to obey God. And their moral compass called the conscious, our conscience, confirmed that this was a morally right decision. And so Israel was given two specific commandments. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 3, the Lord God said to the children of Israel, you must not do as they do in Egypt. This is where they had come from, where you used to live, he says. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. You see, those two things, brothers and sisters, the Lord God had told Israel, two commandments. Do not follow their practices. And the Lord goes on to say the Lord was referring to the ungodly acts that they were committing both in Egypt and in the land of Canaan. He says this, he says, the Lord God was referring to the ungodly acts of idolatry immorality, and for Israel in particular, apostasy. So to do or to not to do is an act of the will, brothers and sisters. As Joshua was about to take the children of Israel into the land of Canaan, he warned them saying, see, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River. You remember that was where Abraham's father used to live over in Mesopotamia, beyond the Euphrates, the land of Ur, if you will. And so he tells them, he says, uh, he says to put away forever the idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone, Joshua says. But he goes on to say, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, he says. If you refuse to serve the Lord, choose, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors? Uh, would you prefer the gods of your ancestors? Your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? Again, he says, but as for me and my family, or for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so I want you to think about this, brothers and sisters. Think about this. In every situation and decision that we make in life, good or bad, good or bad, it is our will 
which makes it final. That's the final step. The will makes the final step and then acting upon that will. In other words, the will makes it, makes it final, driven by our emotions, our intellect, and conscience, whether Jews or Gentile. And so, but as we will see, the words of Deuteronomy 32, 15, chapter 32, verse 15, proved to be true, brothers and sisters. Israel had grown fat and they kicked. Filled with food, they became heavy and sleek. They abandoned, they abandoned the God who made them and rejected the rock as their savior, he says. Now, they did exactly what God had commanded them not to do, brothers and sisters. They began to follow the ways of the people of the land. They worshiped idols. They committed sexual immorality. They sacrificed their children in the fire to appease their, those, those idols, those same idols, the Baals and the Astaroths. They bowed down to lifeless images, worshiped stones, and rebelled against God's moral law. And worst of all, they would commit apostasy by leaving their rock, the God who birthed them, for foreign idols or gods. And to be clear, brothers and sisters, in any age, in any age or dispensation, when any people, whether they're Jews or Gentile, put anything, for example, images, objects, persons, money, material, work, anything, when you put any of those things before God, it becomes your idol. It becomes your idol. And when people abandon or turn away from worshiping and serving the true and living God, the God of creation, and the Lord Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Creator, to do this, to leave them, to leave God, and to follow false religions or religious objects or political figures, this, brothers and sisters, is apostasy, apostasy. In Judges chapter 2, verse 13, it says that they, the children of Israel, forsook the Lord and served Baal. Now, Baal was what was called in that day, in that culture, the supreme male divinity of the Phoenicians and the Canaanites. And the other that they worshiped was called Astaroth, which was a Canaanite goddess. Israel had turned away from God we are fortunate to have the words of the Lord before us to teach us not to do those things that are unrighteous and unholy. God's blessings, brothers and sisters, and protection comes when we are walking in his will, when we are doing the works of the Lord, when we are obeying the word of the Lord. Jesus said, he says what? If you love me, keep my commandments. The love that Jesus was talking about is a verb that means act. If you love me, act, do, keep my words, my commandments. That's what Jesus is saying when he said that. Okay. But make no mistake, friends, make no mistakes. God's blessings and protection comes when we are walking in his will. That is true but so does the Lord's chastening when we are out of his will. And what I mean by chastening, in this case, I'm talking to brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And so this takes us to our biblical study for this morning. And let me go here and move to our next slide. So in Judges chapter six, verses one, verse one, we'll start with verse one. It says this, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian 
for seven years, seven years. And so briefly speaking, brothers and sisters, the book of Judges are accounts of a number of Israel, a number of leaders, better known as judges, who arose to rescue Israel after the death of Joshua from foreign oppressions after they had entered the land of Canaan, the promised land. Eventually, they strayed away from the Lord. These events fit together to paint a picture of a pattern, a pattern, if you will, which went like this. This was a pattern that Israel began going through after the death of Joshua. The Israelites would sin. God would punish them with foreign oppression. The Israelites would repent. The Lord would send a deliverer in the form of a judge. And then peace followed. Peace followed. But unfortunately, brothers and sisters, this was a constant pattern with the Israelites. That's why you see uh, just about 14 judges altogether. But this was a constant pattern. Now the Lord had warned Israel not to marry the people of the land. He had warned them not to, not to marry the people of the land. As far back as Genesis chapter 28, verse 1, Israel was warned to not to marry, not marry a Canaanite woman. Now, they obviously, they are in the land of Canaan now. God has warned them not to do this. And so we know that in Genesis chapter 28, we know that he says that um, when Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, he charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Solomon's temple, Solomon's kingdom, rather, Solomon's kingdom fell because King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, the Hittites, and others. We find this in 1 King, Kings chapter 11, verse 1. For the Lord had clearly warned the children of Israel, saying, From the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. See, that's the warning. God had already warned them before they did these things. Solomon clung to these in love. That's what the scripture tells us, these women. And now, now we see in Judges chapter 3, verse 6, Israel's failure to obey God after that generation had died. So we're talking about, first of all, when the generation that came into the land of Canaan, they were obedient. It's the generation that came after that generation that I'm referring to. And so what we see is that it says that in Judges chapter 3, verse 6, Israel's failure to obey God, this new generation sinned when they came into the land, took their daughters in marriage, and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The judge in today's study, brothers and sisters, whose name is Gideon, was the fifth of around 14 judges. He served in this capacity during the first half of the 12th century BC. The Midianites, the oppressors whom Gideon was about to confront in our study today, came from what is known as Northern Saudi Arabia or Southeastern Jordan. Now, interestingly enough, the Midianites shared a history with Israel long ago, as seen in Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, where Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, 
heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Moses' wife and father-in-law were Midianites. His children were of Midianite and Hebrew descent. Now, however, the Lord will use the Midianites to oppress Israel for seven years because of their disobedience and their stubborn rebellion. The scriptures says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And in most cases, brothers and sisters, this evil had to do with the children of Israel committing idolatry, worshiping foreign gods and idols. Strangely enough, strangely enough, the seven years of oppression set oftentimes set between 40 years uh, of relative quiet for the nation. And so in verse two, we see that it says, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel were made, made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains, in the mountains. The land of Canaan, what we call Israel, had large and small caves that were both natural and man-made. When some felt vulnerable people, the people, they would run or flee to one of these, one of these caves <clears throat> for, for refuge. According to Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, and 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. We find another version of that in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. Strongholds were fortresses that were difficult to access. Not only did they go, for, go there for refuge, but they would store food there as well because whenever Israel would grow crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites would come up against them and destroy it. They would leave no food for the herds or the mules. In fact, brothers and sisters, the Midianites and the Amalekites would bring in their own livestock and camels, which were numerous, and would enter and destroy Israel's land, leaving them impoverished. And so we find in verses 7 through 10 of Judges chapter 6, it says, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. This, this is what the prophet says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptian. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, Israel, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But the prophet goes on to say this, but you have not listened to me. You have not listened to me. So we see for the first time after the children of Israel cried out to the Lord that in his mercy, the Lord sent them a prophet. Now, this is not obviously the first time I'm saying in this particular situation with Gideon. So listen to what the prophet tells them. <clears throat> Again, he says this. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, Notice, friends, notice that the Lord calls them his people. They are God's people. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. This was the evil Israel had done in the sight of the Lord spoken of in verse one. That's the evil. 
The Lord is telling his people that they did not obey his commands. The Lord God had warned Israel long ago of the judgments that would result from their disobedience. Remember, brothers and sisters, the Lord God always gives a warning. He always gives us time and space to repent. God doesn't, God doesn't just come upon us and then his wrath or his punishment comes upon us. He gives us warnings before it happens. The Lord God had warned Israel long ago. Now, this is a similar message of the angel of, J of Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that the angel has spoken as well. And so if you read chapter, uh, Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, you'll see this. And because they did not drive out the people of the land, as they were told to do, they ended up worshiping the gods of the inhabitants of the land. In other words, brothers and sisters, the real problem, the real problem lies with Israel's blending of pagan worship, such as the gods of the Canaanites and the Amorites, with the Hebrew monotheistic, monotheistic worship of the Lord God alone. They blended those worships, those religions, and those practices. And so again, when they, when they did this, the term for that is called syncretism. They were blending pagan religions such as the gods of the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites. They were blending those religions with the Hebrew worship of the Lord God. Now, something that they were commanded not to do because this, this would lead to their uh, destruction and it would lead to them committing idolatry. And remember what God says. God says, he said, I will not give my glory to anyone. I'm paraphrasing. I give my glory to no one. And so when Israel adopted pagan cultural practices, when they adopted pagan cultural practices, brothers and sisters, they committed apostasy because they had abandoned their relationship with and their religious commitment to the Lord God. They had broken the covenant they made with the Lord at Mount Sinai. But God is a merciful God, brothers and sisters. Listen to verses 11 and 12. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the, the Abiazite, Abiazrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites, you see. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And so now we're introduced to the next judge of Israel, Gideon, son of Joash. We find him threshing the wheat in a wine press. That's not, that was not usually the purpose of a wine press, not to thresh wheat. And, you know, this is, a, you know, where, where grapes are normally pressed. But he did this to keep it hidden from the Midianites because the Midianites were taking all of the food from the Israelites. In God's mercy and the cry and the cry of Israel, again, reaching the ears of the Lord, an angel is sent from the Lord in the form of a man. As he sits under the oak tree belonging to Gideon's father, the angel observes Gideon threshing, threshing the wheat. And he says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, the angelic visitor seems more convinced of Gideon's valor than the hero himself. In other words, for the Lord sees the heart, friends. The Lord sees the heart. So the Lord saw what was in Gideon. Just as young David was seen by his older brothers and sisters, and even King Saul as just a boy, 
But the Lord God saw was a courageous warrior, a warrior and a king, a future king. Even though David has started out as just a young shepherd boy, Gideon is just threshing wheat. He's threshing wheat. Gideon, on the other hand, sees himself as somewhat of a frightened fugitive whose clan was the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh. And even as he looked upon, and, and he was looked upon as being the least significant in his family. This was Gideon. But brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, the Lord sees in Gideon a man of valor, valor a mighty warrior and one who would deliver Israel from the Midianites. In other words, brothers and sisters, the Lord God had heard the cries of, of the Israelites. And now in his mercy, he is again going to deliver them. But he's going to deliver them now through the hands of Gideon. As true believers in Christ Jesus, know of a certainty, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus the Christ is with us through every storm that comes our way. Gideon has his storm. That's a storm that he's going through. The Midianites were coming in and they were just, you know, taking the food, destroying the land at will. The Lord knows our strengths and our weaknesses. The Lord knew Gideon's strength and weakness. Our Lord further admonishes us in Hebrew chapter 13, verse five, to do what? Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But the apostle John reminds us also that believers, he says to us, he says for the believer, especially for the believers who, are, who have gone wayward. Israel had gone in a wayward manner. They were in rebellion to God. They were worshiping idols. The gospel tells us if we are gone wayward, if we are out of the will of God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So Israel needed to confess as well. Now they were crying to the Lord. And I guess in their cry, they were repenting. And in God's mercy, he now chooses Gideon. In verse 13, <clears throat> Gideon says this, Pardon me, Lord. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. This lengthy verse tells us a lot about Gideon, brothers and sisters. First of all, it's apparent that the stories of God's delivering Israel beginning in Egypt have been passed down from his ancestors. His question to the angel indicates, <clears throat> excuse me, indicates that he is not aware or he may not be aware of the sins of idolatry the people of Israel are committing. So he cannot make the connection between the suffering that they are enduring and the cause of the suffering. And if God had delivered his people from Egypt, why is God punishing them now? He doesn't understand the commandments and the conditions the Lord had given Israel if they were to leave God's continued blessing. Is it possible, is it possible that it, he hasn't seen the idolatrous acts of the people? Is that possible? Better yet, brothers and sisters, had he not heard from his ancestors the first, the very first commandment 
of the Lord written in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, which says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of, of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So to be clear, Gideon is not casting doubt or unfaithfulness, but rather he's confused. He's confused, brothers and sisters. And so in verses 14 through 16, it goes on to say this, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O Lord, O my Lord, how can I serve, save Israel? How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family's house. That is interesting that God often chooses the least individuals to make the greatest effect. The least. David was just a shepherd. Gideon is the, he says he's the least in his in his family. But God chooses the humble, not the proud. And so he says, he said, again, he says to them, he says, oh, my Lord, how can I say, sir, save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man, as one man. So now, this is interesting. Although we read the phrase, then the Lord turned to him, we must understand, we must refer back to verse 11, where it reads, and the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak. And in verse 12, it reads, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So in verse 14, brothers and sisters, verse 14 is most probably referring to the angel of the Lord. Gideon's reluctance was not unlike that of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. After the Lord has said, he said this, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What was Moses' response? But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? As if to say, I am just a man against the king of Egypt. But what did the Lord say to Moses, brothers and sisters? God said, I will be with you. Gideon's reply was similar in that he said, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house as if to say, I'm the least esteemed in my father's house. How can I defeat such a people as the Midianites? But just as the Lord has said to Moses, I will be with you. And just as the angel of the Lord has said to Gideon earlier, saying that the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, the Lord again tells Gideon, <clears throat> excuse me, surely I will be with you. In other words, Gideon, don't worry. I will be with you. I will be your shield and protection. So listen carefully, brothers and sisters. Listen carefully to the words of the Lord. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. The Lord had said the same thing to Moses. Surely I will be with you and you shall bring the children of Israel out of Egypt as one man. 
from Abraham, whom the Lord God said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward to Moses and now to Gideon. When the Lord is with men, they are always blessed and successful in their efforts, brothers and sisters. The Lord Jesus encourages us as well to know that despite our suffering, we already have the victory. We can go in the power and the strength of the Lord Jesus to Christ. Like Abraham, Moses, Joshua, and now Gideon. We, when we are obedient to the Lord, he will surely be with us. Like the faithful of the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, the obedient child of God must trust in the Lord and apply the words the Lord God had given to Joshua, telling him and us, friends in Christ Jesus, to do what? To be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dis discouraged. For the Lord your God, the Lord our God, will be with you wherever you go. To the believer in Christ Jesus, to the obedient and faithful, the Lord is with us wherever we go. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, your word is true. And you are always with us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, because we know that the Holy Spirit who dwells within us is that guarantee, that seal, that you are always with us. He is our seal. He is our guarantee. We have the victory in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your words, Father. Thank you for your redemption, O oh Lord Jesus. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed and wonderful day, brothers and sisters. Amen.